interesting part of it is we all agree we're preaching to the choir up here. And I think to have real change and real reconciliation, we need some mainstream folk up here we can put their feet to the fire and ask them what are they going to do to create leadership opportunities to change the conversation and change how fashion is represented. Because we all agree with each other. Yep. So there's nothing here up here that, you know, that allows us to really feel grounded in actual change. We'll continue to make art. But it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to have systemic impact. And I know that you know Riley has taken leadership, and your mentor Ben has supported that, which is how allies are supposed to to work. I think more importantly, what we need are folks like Jeannie Becker, who once said at a a, a, a panel, "Oh, Native people don't have they don't have fashion; they have costumes." And I wanted to throw something from her across the room because I thought that was a pretty arrogant thing to say. And I'd like to be able to say that to somebody in, like her in the same room. I think your comments are arrogant. And really hold her to task. So I don't know how to do that when we're always talking to the choir. But at the very least, we're part of changing the conversation. Hopefully the way you, as fashion students, look at your relationship to indigenous fashion. Because if you're not indigenous, it's not your fashion. Canada, we see often here Canada's indigenous people. We don't belong to Canada. Just so you know. I mean, you remind me, so so in organizing today's event, I also um, very strategically sent some invites to people from the fashion industry. And I say strategically because I didn't want to put out this blanket invitation because I think people need to be ready for this information, like you were saying. And so, so I've built personal relationships with people in the fashion industry. Some of them are here in this front row. But it is, I'm being so cautious. I'm being so cautious with how we do this. And it's kind of unfortunate that like we do have to be cautious. Like as Anishinaabe Kwe, as Indigenous people, um, there's been this stigma of being cautious about like our traditions, our fashion, like all of those things that in sh I think in sharing this conversation with everybody, just acknowledging like how hard that can be. So I guess. I want to start. Then let's jump right into like talking about change and talking about reconciliation. To each of you, what does reconciliation look like through fashion and in fashion? Um, so I think for me, uh, reconciliation through fashion and in fashion, I mean, one of the things that I tried to highlight was it's not just a skull with a headdress on and that's like mean or disparaging, it's that there are real world lived effects. And, I, and as I think about it, I think one of the first things is realizing that, that people actually like died and were beaten for wearing these things well into the 70s. That in many places, um, especially across the states, it was illegal to practice native religion until 1976 after all the hippies made being Indian cool. Right after long hair was in, after beads were in, after buckskin vests were in, and it and that's, it's it's a when I think about reconciliation, it's really just that step one. That sh like I don't even think we're at reconciliation, and I think that it's about having conversations and and amplifying those voices that that are still struggling to be heard through the din of. It was so long ago. Why is it a big deal? It's just a feather. Why can't I wear it too? Um, so I don't even think we're at reconciliation. Okay. When was the last residential school closed down? 1996. So that's not even a black and white photograph, folks. It's not. It's not so long ago. My mother was born in 1945. Think of anybody in your family born in 1945. Put a heartbeat to this history. That's reconciliation. When you acknowledge that people's lives were impacted and I think the saddest thing I heard, we talked about language as, as central to transmitting culture. My uncle had pins put in his tongue for speaking his language. And he's born within your, probably your parents' lifetime. So it's not such a long ago history. So knowing your history is really vital, um, is an act of reconciliation. So if you imagine a figure eight and figure that, you know, if you don't know your history and you want to make right relations, you need to know your history to make right relations. And so reconciliation will come from those right relations. Once you know what not to say, don't call people Indians, <laughs> certain 101 things, right? Ask what people prefer to be called. Um, but then indigenous people, I think an act of reconciliation is acknowledging that we use modern mediums. I call this my super indigenous bracelet every time I want to feel super because this is an indigenous artist. 
And just because she uses modern materials doesn't make it less any, any less indigenous. Um, even just having you know silver on or something that's not traditional, it's still an expression of my identity. So I think. <coughs> For me, uh, my act of reconciliation is making meaning out of what I wear. So if you ever see me, it's like, oh, what are you representing? I'll probably tell. I think the first thing I thought of in that question is, you know, like, yeah, reconciliation, it's maybe not here yet. It's going to be a long, strenuous process. But I think what comes first is allyship. Um, something I've been doing both as a facilitator and as an artist is promoting allyship and really getting people to think about how they can incorporate and like weave that into their daily practice and into their thought process and in turn translate that into a form of reconciliation, whether it's on a small scale and then it translates into something much larger one day. Um, someone recently told me, um, clarified my understanding about uh, allies, and they, and they said that an ally is not a noun. You are not an ally. Allyship is a verb because it's an ongoing process. It's like, what are you doing every day um, to help us in reconciliation? And I mean, I used to kind of think reconciliation was like this big complicated thing, and like to fashion reconciliation, this kind of design cultural resurgence project that, that we're all building. Um, but like, it's, it's this big thing that I don't understand. But really I've come to understand that it's like very personal and it's about relationship building, like one on one relationship building. Like I met Angela de Montigny, and I worked in her shop, and she, and like I went to your backyard, and like I met her in her backyard. Like it's just, there's no like magic formula. It's just like meeting each other and doing things like this. And I think like spaces are so important. Like where are we gonna meet? Like like I want to have like tea with all y'all after this. Like let's like, <laughs> but you know like let's like continue to continue to continue to build things. We had a guest that was here a little bit earlier and had to leave, and she gave a really solid example that she is an indigenous woman teaching folks how to make mukluks for as a, a work with Manitoba mukluks. And she has a non-native woman who's getting really great compliments on her mukluks, but she's really struggling. Well, what do I do? People want me to make their mukluks. And so this artist is trying to figure out how to have this conversation, and I said, well, she can make mukluks in the spirit of giveaway and no, no issues. But she can't make mukluks and sell them now. Yeah. She can't. Just because she knows now doesn't make it her intellectual property and she does have no right to make money off that. But in the spirit of an indigenous ethic, she could make it for giveaway to her family, to her friends. To her. She can keep that tradition alive and uh, mindful, but because she's not indigenous, she doesn't get to sell those mukluks now. But what she can do is be a courtesy and refer folks that are interested to authentic artists who do still make mukluks. Because there are upwards of 70 to 90,000 indigenous people in the GTA. Hello, we're here among you every day, sitting next to you on the subway. We're here and there's a lot of us that make art and it's, it's really that's where allyship comes in, that you act on your curiosity and still benefit indigenous people, not go where it's cheaper because a non-native person's making it. Do the community a favor and, and buy authentic is sort of the narrative there. Yeah, I want to talk I want to talk more about that. Have you have you encountered cultural appropriation? What and what impact I mean if you're like <laughs> yes. And what impact does it have? Because I think, you know, as we think about the design process and for you know not for non indigenous designers. It's really important to understand, like, it has real impacts. Um, I think, yeah, I think that, so already touching on kind of that it condones violence, it condones invisibility, um, but there's, there's this twofold thing happening where so many ways of making, so many patterns are community building, they're healing, they're medicine, and they're also examples of sustainable models of making that don't commit violence against the environment, that don't commit violence against a lot of indigenous people in other countries are forced to work in these factories, right? Because they're the bottom rung in their own countries. And so I think that when you, when I look at appropriation, there's the first thing of it's not yours. There's the second thing, which we've all touched on of why are you making money? And then there's this third thing of where's the medicine? Where's the healing? You're actively destroying community and the fourth thing is you're actually destroying people's lives and the environment that have to make this thing. And so, you know, but again, like step one with appropriation is sometimes asking 
I had a student in one of my classes who I forget what company, but always wore the skull with the headdress t-shirt. And I think he was just one of those antagonistic personalities. Even though we had talked about appropriation and representation over and over, and finally I asked him, I was like, why do you think it's okay to wear that? And he was just like, his honest answer was nothing political or anything. He's like, I just think it's cool. And I had no idea how to speak back to like, I've been telling you for weeks. Wait, I forgot the quote. Oh, appropriation. <laughs> but sometimes that's where that's where that that avenue of having those conversations when you see somebody wearing that stuff, right? It's like, you know, it can't. It's easy for people to write off the person that's being offended, right? It's a whole other experience when everyone in the room is saying that's not cool. Like that's not okay. Uh, one of the things that I'm mindful of is I'm a West Coaster, and I think in some ways that sort of, my art doesn't sell so well out here. I think if I were back home, I might sell more because it's a different aesthetic. So here, I'm really mindful not to appropriate the flower scene, or because I know people who do that really well, and it's not my place to make Ojibwe flowers. I'm not Ojibwe. Or like Haudenosaunee wampum belts, or I'm not that culture. So I'm mindful not to appropriate other people's culture, but I will collaborate. If you have permission to work with that art, I will work with you, because it's permission. Who, who has that intellectual property, that art? So if you had a beautiful caribou, something, something, I'd probably make it into like 10 pieces of fabric and tell a story with that, but I wouldn't do it without your permission. And it would probably be something we bartered on as opposed to cash, right? Like, so there's a relationship to the art. So I feel obliged not to appropriate other indigenous artists because they're artists in their own right. And it's not my place to see their art. If I'm running out of ideas, I wait for a dream or something, but I don't steal other people's art in the meantime. Um, I think for me, some of the roadblocks I've hit is that a lot of the significance of artwork that comes from these talented indigenous artists are linked to tradition. And the story that I shared with you about Copper Woman, like that's a tr traditional story that was shared with me from an elder from the Blood Tribes. And you know, these pieces, these designs, they all have stories, they all have meaning. And when something's appropriated without meaning, there's no context, there's no meaning to it. Like, What's the point? Yeah, I think we touched on this earlier. It's just like the emotional labor of of, con of, of seeing cultural appropriation. Like, um, you know, it can it can ruin my day. Uh, <laughs> which, like, it's not it's not trivial. Like, it's a very emotional impact. Cause, like, so I see I see um, Dreamcatchers at, at like a festival, and, and Joe sees me seeing these, and he looks at me and he's like, "What are you gonna do?" <laughs> It's like I can like take this person to town and like in a in a very kind and loving way I'm gonna explain <laughs> why it's a problem that you're doing this at this music festival. Or you know, I can just try and forget about it, but I'm not gonna forget about it. Um, so like that's why, you know, I'm just thinking like that's the role sometimes of other people, of non-indigenous people, is that when you see that cultural appropriation, it's like you do that effort of educating. I just wanted to share another story. So Halloween, headdresses galore, raises buffalo. I put that in context, and I have a friend of mine who was like, I'm going to be a really great ally. Runs up to this like six foot two linebacker looking dude and just says, what's with the headdress, bro? And immediately gets clocked in the face. And he's a 5'5 five -five guy. And he's down, and he's skinny, and the guy starts kicking him until my one friend like interjected and was like, I'm calling the cops, and started recording things. So again, like it's never, even for a non-indigenous, like, this hetero male person just saying what's with the headdress dude like it immediately became violent and so that's where I think a lot of strategies of contact the Halloween stories get a petition going around that go above things that put yourself and other people at physical risk a lot of time um, there's like a new initiative in Hamilton um, I gotta share this with y'all but um, like there's a there's a team of lawyers who are gonna try and pass a city bylaw like a city level bylaw like rather, I mean, like there's so, so there's work being done at the UN to protect intellect, intellectual property, but, you know, at the, at the city level to prevent dollar stores from doing that. You know, so there's all kinds of different strategies, um, and I mean, I've learned the hard way. Like I've seen some some really bad tattoos. Um, I'm thinking of uh, a particular influencer, an Instagram influencer, who got a tattoo, and I just the first message I sent to him on Instagram was WTF, <laughs> capitalized, and. <laughs> 
but that but that instantly instantly his barrier his walls go up and it's just like I, I approached that in the wrong way and I heard a really great metaphor from the elder here at Ryerson um, she said don't be a stick and be beating people on the head like bad appropriator bad appropriator um, <laughs> be a door be a door instead and say okay come in like come in when you are ready to learn come in and like I'll answer your questions can I just add the context for sleep uh, for Dream catchers. I'm not even from the culture that makes dream catchers, but it cracks me up when I see them in a car. Because man, you're supposed to be driving. The <laughs> context is lost. If people have dream catchers in their car, unless it's like an autopilot car, there's no context to why that dream catcher is there. So it's it's knowing your relationship to the art. It's not just random. <laughs> So I want to build on this idea of allyship. So what do you think about respectful collaboration? And how can non-Indigenous designers be a cult culturally appreciative? What does that look like? What does allyship, what does respectful collaboration look like in a design context? Do you know Andy Warhol? Yeah. <laughs> Andy Warhol is someone who has other people make his art. That's how I understand Andy Warhol. Only that I, I had a, a time when I got to be in an exhibition at Sage called Cardinal Organized, and it was called Indian Giver. And I had a bald Victorian gal who really needed a hat. But I didn't have time to make the hat and go home and finish some cedar bark. So I called my best mate, who has a thick British accent, Kaz. Kaz, get down here, help me weave. So I set up the weaving, but I got the grant to go home to BC to get the cedar bark. I went to the forest. I gave thanks to every tree I harvested from. I brought that cedar bark all the way back to Toronto. I dried that cedar bark. I soaked that cedar bark. I made that cedar bark ribbon thin. I set it up for my pal. Whose weave is it? I made this white lady hat while my British mate made this weave. After all of that love and energy I put into gathering it, it's still my weave. And we called that our artistic act of reconciliation. She didn't say, I wove for Jeanette, it's my weave. She helped me get to where I artistically needed to go. And that's what best mates do. She happened to be white and really good at taking direction, but it was like this little Andy Warhol moment. And neither of us felt guilt, because it was still my weave. So that's an act of collaboration. She didn't take credit. But I fed her really well while she was there. <laughs> you know, we had a good visit, and you know, we, it was part of that relationship to the art. And she gen was generous because I modeled generously teaching her how to make that art. So we both win from it. So that's an example of my experience with collaboration. And I touched on this earlier when I did these um, sign installations at Art Park. Uh, a person that I still collaborate with, non-native person, also uh, not from Buffalo. Um, and she has always, like, as soon as we met, like, she was immediately like, I will do all of the crappy parts of making art. Like, that has been her stance since, like, day one. She's like, this is the voice that needs to be amplified, and we will figure out how to do it together. But she's been very incredible about really taking the lead on doing the work of, like, why, why is it important to have Haudenosaunee public art in Buffalo? Like, duh. Like, um... But she actively does that. And then that same show, I had so many people come over and help me, like learn different skills. And the same with the mush hole is that I had so many non-native friends come over who were like, who like knew I was freaking out because I'm really over ambitious and not good with time management at all. And so they would come over and, and help me in these really giving ways. But the trade-off also was that I had native friends who came over to help just to learn like corn husk twining, which is a dying Haudenosaunee way of making textiles. I had people come over just to learn to sew, and then they would sew like 100 aprons for me for an installation. And, and for me, it's not just about you're the non-native person, you have to do the crappy stuff. It's about, to, like, it's about evening the power structure, right? Even in interpersonal relationships sometimes. And also that non-native people tend to listen to like, you know, non-native people more than native people, right? It's like the same logic. Um, like I think um, that the collaboration just has to be like on indigenous terms. Um, like you, like an indigenous person can't be invited to like a Western fashion business to do it. Like it should be, it should be the different direction. So this is a, this to sort of a bigger question. Um, 
Can indigenous designers operate in the Western fashion industry, in the current fashion industry? Or do you think there's a need for a different system? How does that work? It's a big question. Go ahead. I'm just gonna say, uh, I'm a big fan of artistic advocacy and taking up space. Um, especially when you say specifically like Western fashion, what does that mean? You know? We have to insert ourselves sometimes in order to make that space. And I feel like the people on the stage and also some of the people that I know here, we're not afraid to do that. Um, so I think just asserting yourself in a good way, it, like in a healthy way, um, sometimes it might not be so healthy, but like, you know, for resurgence, you kind of need to be a little aggressive sometimes. <laughs> I had, a, I had the good fortune of doing tours for government officials during the Anishinaabe Art Power Exhibition at the, at the Royal Ontario Museum, and I took liberties when the Minister of Indigenous, whatever they call themselves, Affairs, Reconciliation, Provincial Minister of Indigenous Affairs. And I reminded him of the potlatch ban, and I locked eyes with him, and I said, I think Indigenous arts requires a boost in funding for no less than 76 years. And I was just very in his face about it, because I know who my audience is, that we really need to see uh, a commitment, systemic commitment, to uh, really make up some time. We've been kicked out of the sea. We have Dior at the ROM right now, and it's eye candy, absolute eye candy. The pleats alone are amazing. But Dior is at a time in history when colonization was at its peak. When the rest of the world was coming out of World War II, there were still bio-nutritional medical experiments where indigenous children were being starved on purpose in residential schools. When the human Declaration of Human Rights was being passed, indigenous people were still being guinea pigs in these residential schools. We didn't have our humanity until we got the right to vote till 1960. We didn't have the right to vote until 1960. Quebec held out until 1969. We have not had footing in this country to fully participate, and so shit gets replicated badly because we haven't had a chance to participate in the front line of the fashion industry. So what I would like to see is a Dior exhibition that is just fueled by indigenous uh, artistic expression at some point. Like we need an indigenous timeline to go back and autocorrect where we've been left out. So I think we have something to say. <laughs> it's not just Western fashion, man, it's world fashion. Let's take that W in fashion as far as Western or the white world, because white isn't always right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Consider what indigenous fashion is, and, and I, somebody said it today. I'm going to guess Brian, but um, considering what indigenous fashion is, is it keeps coming back to a model of respect, right? To a model of respect for models, to a model of respect that a lot of the things that indigenous artists, indigenous textile artists, indigenous fashion makers make is medicine, carries ceremony, respect for for the effect that it has on other people. And I know that in conversations around Indigenous Fashion Week that is being centered, is it's not about replicating this model, as you say, that hurts people, hurts the world, and is about money and flash and bang and just walk it and get out of there and like get on to the next thing. It's about how, how is a new model being created to, to center what, what this means, what are the implications, and, and to give people something else to really pick up and run with. <laughs> no, I just wanted to, yeah, on that point of indigenous fashion, but that was, so that was my question, but it is a very philosophical question, like, can we participate, do we even want to participate in the fashion industry when it's been so, you know, so extractive of, of indigenous peoples, um, but like, you mentioned, for example, like, like, bartering, like, things like that, like, I'm, I'm thinking of different systems entirely. And I was just gonna say, like, I went to Hamilton Fashion Week and I was sitting there and I'm like, why am I here? I'm like, I don't, I don't understand what's happening. Why is this, a, this girl that's just wearing this skinniest clothing? And I'm like, what is that? I don't understand. And the other thought that I just had was, you know, we're talking about indigenous fashion, but there's indigenous communities internationally 
and like my partner's Filipino and he's so disconnected from his culture that he's like, we have indigenous people too, they're called Tahoe. So it's like, what does that fashion look like? What, like, where is the inclusivity? I also think that, I mean, I, I put in a, a, a submission to be part of indigenous fashion week, which would be hopeful, but one of the things I pitched was this notion of wearing real clothes. Like maybe after baby number three, man, I stopped making skinny mini stuff. Because <laughs> I'm not so skinny mini anymore. Three babies later, my body grows. But also, clothes need to fit real people. And I have to, you know, to have lost weight. Not actually didn't lose weight on this cancer journey. I lost mass. But nonetheless, you know, I'm still considered a plus size in the West, you know, in the Western world, but, well, I'm as fit as I've been in a long time, especially after three babies. But I think it's also turning, you know, having a different conversation about our relationship to our body. I think one of the things that Riley and I talked about when we were getting ready for today is how fashion is a relationship to the outside world, and what you want people to see and how you're represented with your clothes. But really, when we wear fashion as Indigenous people, it's representing our inside. It's telling you who I am where I come from, what's my relationship to the land and the world around me. And I'm not defined by the world outside myself, but I'm allowing the clothes to define. What I, I was a trauma counselor for more than 20 years, and someone said, why do you dress so well? I said, if someone slams the door in my face, at least I look good. Because <laughs> you just don't know what kind of work's going to happen, you know, what's going to happen in a day. So clothes become a way of expressing my, my safety net, my, and when, when I leave my day, kind of like when West Coasters, um, leave a dance, we turn. So to say, physically, the dance is over. When I go home and my day is done, I change my clothes, the day is done. I don't carry that energy with me. I wear bling on purpose to bounce negative energy back to center. And other cultures do the same thing. If I'm going into a meeting with someone who gives me stink eye most of the time, I wear bling because I know that's just my ritual to, to stay centered and grounded and not take off that energy. But also numbers. Indigenous culture, while we might have symbols, we have lots of relationships to numbers. Us West Coasters love our screens, bouncing the past, present, and future. Sweet grass, I was told, gets mistaken for bouncing the mind, body, and spirit, but that's a Christian value that was placed on sweet grass. I've heard sweet grass from the Medea women, that's just a humble bit of knowledge I know because it's not my tradition. Balances your relationship to the past, present, and future. Seven, lots of numbers, lots of meaning around seven. Um, you know, and these are conversations for you to have with Indigenous people. Thirteen, we have, why are we called Mother Earth? Because I heard from the um, creation story in this region that uh, Moon and Grandma Moon and Grandma Sun hooked up and she gave birth to Mother Earth. So that's why we have a relationship to the Earth. And we're not separate from the Sun and the Moon. We greet the Sun and Grandma Moon drives all of us as women because it's linked to our, our monthly cycle. And our relationship, our strong relationship as life givers um, has been, uh, what's the word, diluted in Western colonization because what uh, patriarchy took over. So women's power and, and place in community has been decentered, has been decentered. And fashion, not to say that only women make fashion, but we're, you know, we stitch, we were talking about waterproof hand stitching, haute couture. Shut up! You have no idea how long we've been doing doing uh, hand stitching and haute couture. So I think in this lifetime we should learn what is hand stitching. If the car goes out, man. Um, so I also want to talk about Indigenous Fashion Week and how might a, an Indigenous Fashion Week like what does that look like? How does it differ? Because it, you know, I imagine it's not going to be that runway and that like that image. Like, is it about community? Like, what, what does that look like? Um, so, I'm curatorial coordinator for Indigenous Fashion Week Toronto. This is uh, Sage Paul is in the front row here. Um, this is her, her project, her, her, um, her gift to us all, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, and so, in the conversations, like, what it keeps coming back to is how do we honor the participants? How do we honor the stories that they're telling? How do we honor um, their, their either artistic vision, their ceremonial vision, is it a combination between the two? How do, how do we give people access to ways, because capitalism, to making money, right? And this goes back to kind of how we were talking, you said the barter thing, and I thought back, so many indigenous communities, like we've always had indigenous fashion, and most people barter. It's like, I have a bunch of feathers, you have a hide, you're good at bead work, I'll swap this, you swap that. There's not a lot of money changing hands, it's a lot of skill changing hands but you can't pay your hydro with like some nice moccasins, right? 
So how do we give people access to either sell or to wholesale or to to people who want to commission pieces or even hang them on their walls? Like what what does it look like to really put people in a position of power for their for their desires and their voices? And I will say the School of Fashion is uh, going to be supporting Indigenous Fashion Week, and there'll be opportunities for all of you, and so uh, we'll share more of that within the class. Um, so in front of us, we have really the next generation of the fashion industry, fashion designers uh, in apparel design and communications and marketing and business and strategy. What's your advice to them? How can they move forward? <laughs> to how can they move forward both within school now, right, as students what they could do, but also once they think about graduating and moving into the industry. I think there's uh, like an indigenous ethic of thinking of yourself, family, community, nation, province, world, universe. So start with yourself. And, and influence your, your art based on your own identity. And you know, if you have to do a bit of research, do a bit of research. But I think that's where, you're, where uh, it influences. And if you think about, I guess, working with indigenous people or people across cultures, allow to be you know, in allyship, work from that self that you're working with. So if you're working with, say, Jeanette, you know, you'll probably see a lot more killer whales and wolves and eagles and whatever it is that I bring. But mostly it's about supporting the creative vision of the people you're working with as opposed to taking over someone else's creative vision. But mostly if you can, anchor yourself in your own identity and how to oppose your making or the, you know, the, the marketing approach, the strategies you take. Uh, elevate who you are becoming and who your community is becoming because ultimately what we want, I would like to see, is that we're modern. I heard a bunch of you say, that's a really old word. Okay, contemporary. It's the same thing, but we're, we're, we fully participate in the industry, uh, like in, in life every day and day, you know, every day. So mostly it's um, really creating space for indigenous people to continue to represent, represent themselves in a modern way. And if you can help facilitate that conversation or help secure a space or a venue or funding, but allow indigenous people to be the center of that that momentum, if you're going to work across cultures, work with, with indigenous people, taking the lead and learn how to take good direction. Either that or represent your own self you know, from that, that heart place that is so that so you're being authentic to yourself. Don't try to take other people's ideas and make them your own. Because it's gonna piss somebody off. <laughs> and it, it, we're in a unique position to encourage you not to do that. I think just adding on to that, like in terms of translating your identity, like your culture, your beliefs into fashion, into art. I do realize I can put you in like kind of a vulnerable situation. Um, so if that is something that motivates you and makes you feel excited, like do it unapologetically. Because if you don't, then people are just gonna like try to tear you down and maybe poke holes. But at the end of the day, remembering that it's your identity, it's your passion, do it unapologetically. like 12 years ago into whatever the heck it was I was going to be doing until I was back in the earth. Somebody just asked me a really good question, which was, well, two questions. The first being like, what's your story? Like, what do you want people to know? And then the other being, what can you talk about for the next 40 years? Like, and that was a really helpful framework because especially whether it's an academic avenue or whether you have like a certain branding angle, like, what can you imagine talking about for the next 40 years? And that was a really helpful way to like, for me, that vulnerability was crippling for a while. Like I really had to just like take this need to like fully tell all of these terrible things in the world with myself away and be like, okay, what can I actually handle talking about for the next 40 years? Um, and that was a really good jumping off point. So, do we have time for one more question quickly? Okay. In sort of 10 words or less, um, where would you like to see the fashion industry in 10 years from now? 
Um, I think for me, uh, the simplest answer is to acknowledge that every piece of clothing, like myself included on my body, probably did harm to the environment and to other human beings. Um, to acknowledge that reconciliation isn't just bounded within Canada, it's a, it's a global project that's starting here with these truths. And it's about, um, I think, for me, where I'd like to see it go is really to a place of, of do no harm. But that's like a six year project, but you gotta start somewhere. I just like to see some, I'd like to see a label. I'd like to have a label. Like just to see more labels. Like people just really being in a front and center, uh, present, won't be ignored kind of way. Yeah, um, I would like to see more like different kinds of, of indigenous fashion businesses. Like, let's look at cooperatives. Let's work at like, like what does it mean? Like, we have these like these massive conglomerates. Like, LVMH owns so many different luxury fashion brands. Like, what if we had an indigenous brand that we all work together? I mean, my dad's uh, he's a union guy, so I'm thinking like, what does a bead workers union look like? Like, what is what does it mean to like set our own prices to set our own everything? Like, let's. So something I didn't mention in my intro, um, Sweetgrass Sisters Collective is like my side hustle. Um, my Monday to Friday, I work at a nonprofit organization called Right to Play. Um, so I'm gonna put on my Right to Play hat for a second. Um, so the program I work with, we partner with indigenous communities across four provinces of Canada, blah, blah. What I would really like to see is some like really solid role models for youth who might have a passion, a passion for fashion, um, or something the like, because we want to create an encouraging Odena. We want to create a community of strong, passionate, and driven people that will make a dent and hopefully a change. I was thinking that I'd like to see you. There's like t-shirts and really high fashion. I'd like to be an indigenous gap. We're running 50 bucks, 50 bucks, 50 bucks. <laughs> Where you don't have to be freaky rich to buy our outfits and you don't have to be relegated. I don't ever wear t-shirts for that matter, but sort of somewhere in between an indigenous gap. Um, I was thinking, of, I wore my moccasins on purpose today just to remind folks what moccasins mean to some indigenous people. On this cancer journey, one of my good uh, uh, mentors, Louise Puppet of Law, she said, walk in beauty on this cancer journey. So I remember to wear my moccasins. And it's also a reminder to walk softly on this planet. So when you see someone stomp into a meeting, just think in your mind, oh, where are their moccasins? But you know, walk softly if we're on a living planet, right? And so again, create some meaning with, with, uh, with the walk you take in this life and the walk you take in this program. Thank you very much. Thank you.